A very warm welcome to this week's episode of Eco Africa. I am Sandra Twinoblio coming to you from Kampala here in Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. Well, we do start by asking you, did you know that there are certain natural foods that have disappeared from our diets almost completely? Even though they are highly nutritious and also resistant to environmental influences, one such crop is now making a comeback in Mali and this is going to interest you. Hi Sandra, yes and I can't believe it, we always have many good tips here on Eco Africa. I'm Neo Taegwe in the nation's capital, Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Let's take a look at what's coming up on the show today. The climate resistant grain that's becoming popular in Mali will tell you why. The Ugandan teenager who's championing climate change activism will tell you how. And the women in Zimbabwe training to be rangers to fight poaching will give you the details. The fonio grain has grown in Africa, West Africa, for around 5,000 years, and with more and more areas being given over to rice, it had largely disappeared. The extremely small grain can be difficult to peel, but it contains many more nutrients than, say, white rice. In Mali, for instance, many farmers are now switching back to this form of millet as it copes well with the arid conditions in the region, making it a good option in an age of climate change where the farmers are regularly suffering crop losses. It's harvest time in Tominyan, a district in the central eastern region of Mali near the border of Burkina Faso. They're harvesting fonio, a crop native to West Africa, a kind of millet with small seeds and excellent properties. It's one of the fastest growing crops in the world. It grows in dry climates and sandy soil even without irrigation. For a long time, fonio was neglected, but now more and more farmers are growing it again. Pierre Terra is one of them. We have to take land degradation into account. Fonio is much in demand again now because it helps protect the soil. After the fonio has been cut, the stems are left in the ground, and that helps to fertilize the soil. Because the grains are small, processing them is very time-consuming. Traditionally, fonio is threshed on straw mats. Then the seeds are mixed with sand and pounded in a mortar. It takes hours to extract a couple of kilos of the edible part of the grain. But things have changed here since the Swiss NGO Helvetas provided new machines that make it much easier to process the grains. The one machine separates the grains from the stems. The other removes the husks in no time. That saves these women a lot of work. Now they only need to sift the grains to remove any remaining impurities. We used to have to pound the grains till our hands got red and sore. But thanks to the machines from Helvetas, we don't need to do that anymore. Now it's far less strenuous. We can just wash the grains and put them in the pot to cook. The grains are used to make porridge, couscous, bread, and also beer. Ibrahim Suleiman Tuankara runs a restaurant in the capital Bamako. Fornio used to be reserved for special occasions and festivities, but now it's becoming a daily staple. We wash the fonio very thoroughly, and we prepare it in such a way that people can eat it at any time. We serve it with two kinds of sauces, a peanut sauce, mafe, or a tomato sauce. But the most popular dish on the menu at Le Bafing is mango chicken with fonio. Many guests come especially for that. Fonio is really the best food in Mali. We eat it all the time at home. I often ask my wife to make it for me. But we've come here as a special treat because it's so incredibly good the way they make it here. Fonio is not only tasty, it's also very nutritious. 
Scientists say it has exceptional qualities, making it superior to rice and corn. Yara Koresi Dambele is a nutrition expert at the Institute for Rural Economy in Bamako. It is very rich in essential amino acids, which are important for the body. It is a product that is very rich in fiber, so it is more digestible than other kinds of millet, rice and corn. Back in Tominyan, Pierre Terra is teaching younger colleagues how to make compost. In order to facilitate the process, they cover the pile with fonio straw. The fonio stems protect the compost from the sun. So there are many reasons why this ancient staple grain is regaining popularity in Mali. The demand for fonio has been growing in recent years and its price has been rising too. This gives farmers an opportunity to boost their income. What happens when you cut down a tree in your garden? Well, it's one tree less, you might say, but what happens when thousands of trees disappear in one region? The effects can soon be felt. The ground dries out, the humidity goes down and biodiversity is reduced. Not a happy event. Our EcoCheck has the facts and the figures. Every year, around 2.8 million hectares of forest are lost on the African continent. That's about the size of Equatorial Guinea. Most of the forests are cleared to provide space for farming, a full 93% for shifting cultivation. A lot of the timber is used as firewood or turned into charcoal, both vital energy sources for rural populations. Charcoal is also exported. 40% of the charcoal imported to the European Union comes from Africa. Deforestation contributes to climate change and to a loss of biodiversity. As a result of poaching and the clearing of woodlands, the forest elephant population in Central Africa declined by two-thirds between 2008 and 2016. But there's good news too, thanks to a range of reforestation projects. 27 African countries aim to plant 100 million hectares of new forest by 2030. That's an area almost three times the size of Germany. So, are you prepared to plant trees now? The situation of forests is very serious, as we've heard, and one young climate change campaigner from Uganda is taking action. And guess what? She's just 15 years old. Yes, Leia Namgera had the idea of planting trees on birthdays instead of having the traditional cake, drinks and parties. She's also demanding action from the local and global leaders to counter the negative impacts of climate change. We recently met up with her. Liana Mugerwa is leading this protest against climate change. In the Ugandan capital of Kampala, students are taking to the streets. They are part of the global movement Fridays for Future, demanding government action to curb climate change. The reason why we protest is that we are young people and we are fighting for our future. And we protest every Friday to fight for our future and the mother nature. I think people of my age are coming up to protest because they know they have the biggest stake in our future and they are trying to fight for it. When Liana Mugirwa turned 15 last year, she didn't want a cake or a party. Instead, she decided to celebrate her birthday by planting 200 trees. In August, she launched a Twitter campaign with the hashtag birthday trees, which got a lot of attention. Since then, People in Uganda have planted over 3,000 trees on their birthdays as a way of giving back to the planet. If you're 18 years old, you can plant 18 
trees. If at all you're 30, you can plant 30 trees. For instance, if at all we do that, we keep on doing that, we can, for example, we are 42, bil 42 million people in Uganda. We shall make that goal of planting 1 billion trees in 25 years. But not many Ugandans own land that is suitable for a forest, and much of the space is used for agriculture. That is why the young activist wants the government to allow her to plant the trees in nature reserves. She has also convinced some landowners to allow her to plant trees on their private land. If I had planted on every birthday, that would be quite a big forest by now. And if we go on doing it every year, someone plants 10 trees minimum. Within 10 years, the whole forest area of Uganda will be back in shape again. Despite some resistance, more and more students in Uganda are joining her cause. Every Friday, Leah Namgela leaves her boarding school to strike for climate justice, demanding government action against the global climate crisis. The campaign has gone viral on social media. I want the government to know that this climate action is real and it's needed now. All this is taking place. So I want the government also get to see what Uganda is passing through. And they also take part and also take part of their responsibilities. Liana Mgera also doesn't shy away of getting her hands dirty. She and other youth activists went to Lake Victoria, which is not far from her school. Together they collected plastic waste from its shores and encouraged locals to do the same. She also started an online campaign to force the government to ban plastic bags in Uganda. And then we cannot just preach and preach and tell people don't do this without practicing what we preach. And when we first started the lecture cleanups, we found a lot of rubbish because it was a market day and everyone would just throw rubbish in the lakes. But since they started seeing us cleaning the lakes, people are, have not even got used to us. When they see us, they're like, we are going to clean the lake now. And they, they are being cooperative. They know that it's not right to throw the rubbish in the lake. Even with some of the rubbish on the lake cleaned up, Liana Mgura faces huge challenges. Fortunately, she can count on her family to support her. Her father even pays for the seedlings. He's faced public criticism for his daughter's activism. But he says that he would rather see her on the streets fighting for a good cause than staying silent when the planet needs her help. Traditional half-timbered houses have been built in Europe for hundreds of years. The surprising thing is that these houses are not only pretty but also very sustainable. That is why some builders in Germany are starting to adopt this style once again. Let's take a look at one of these new but old-fashioned houses. This picturesque backdrop looks like something out of a fairy tale. But old half-timbered houses can be found in many European cities. The tradition dates back to the 12th century. Buildings are constructed from a wooden structure filled with brick or loam. That made sense. Wood, sand, and clay were all freely available materials. This half-timbered house is not even one year old yet. It was built using the old methods, half-timbered inside and outside. For owner Norbert Hofmann, it was important to have a low-energy home equipped with the latest technology. But the roof, too, is based on a historical design. It's a so-called cold roof, which is well-ventilated. That's an old building technique in the sense that in the past there were only cold roofs. And you notice that in the old barns, in old buildings where attics are not insulated. In the summer, it remains a quite pleasant temperature at the top of the house. But that's solely down to the way it's constructed. At the same time, the heating technology in the house is cutting edge. A fuel cell supplies the building with electricity. A solar thermal system provides warm water. 
On the ground floor, an underfloor heating system is being built that uses brick to store the warmth. The windows are made of smart glass that darkens when the sun shines, keeping out about 90% of the heat in summer. The house was built by construction company owner Heiko Schulz. For more than 25 years, he's been building half-timbered houses based on old designs, but with the latest technology inside. It's a real challenge. People used to build very differently centuries back. No one was concerned with energy efficiency, etc. These days we have to work with significantly thicker walls and accommodate very different things. Windows have to be fitted completely differently, and it all has to be done so that it's not visible outside. The wooden skeleton is constructed in a carpenter's workshop, using only timber grown in Europe. Just as in olden times, no nails are used. Instead, the beams are connected with joints secured with oak pegs, in keeping with traditional methods. This is a joint that has been used by carpenters for centuries. Only wood is used. The advantage is that it expands in the same way when temperatures fluctuate. That's not the case if you use wood together with metal, and that can cause damage in the long term. About 12 cubic meters of wood are needed to construct a house with an area of 200 square meters. If you place the timbers end to end, they would stretch almost one kilometer. It might sound like a lot, but wood is a lot more sustainable than other conventional building materials like concrete and cement. Today's new half-timbered houses fit seamlessly into their surroundings. And if their historical counterparts are anything to go by, they too will have centuries ahead of them. Back in Africa now, we go to Tanzania. People call him the father of rural innovation. Bernard Kiwia was just 16 when he started tinkering with stuff and inventing things. It is still what he loves doing most, and he also loves to share his knowledge. We visited his innovation hub, where new ideas get developed in workshops, and a lot of them are environmentally friendly. Where there's a will, there's a way. Bernard Kiwia has taken that proverb to heart. Largely self-taught, he's an expert at devising mechanical and electrical devices. This machine, for example, flattens inner tubes for a drip irrigation system. The point of an invention is that it has an obvious benefit. I realized that the environment has been neglected, even though it's so important to human life. So I decided to focus on technology that works with the environment. At home, he installed this windmill to produce energy. It powers his homemade washing machine and pumps the water for it from a nearby borehole. His invention isn't just environmentally friendly, it also saves a lot of time and labor. When there's no wind, he uses a stationary bicycle to pump water. That was his first invention. At home, we don't use power from the national grid. We can harness energy from the sun, and the sun is free. It's the power of nature. You don't have to pay anything. All you need to do is get the parts that convert sun into power and install them, and you're protecting the environment. The prolific innovator shares his knowledge and passion with others. A few years ago, he co-founded the Twende Social Innovation Center in the city of Arusha. Here, he and other staff members offer workshops and develop new ideas, like using recycled materials to construct a wheelchair. Project manager John Nzira is here every day. He and Bernard Kiwia regularly consult on technical issues. Twende is a social innovation center that seeks to empower the community to solve their own local challenges using local technologies. The community can feel that we don't have, we don't import this knowledge or these things from outside. These are the things that we have, we use them at home. These are the things that we find in the local shops that can help us. 
Many of the contracts come from farmers asking, for example, if it might be possible to construct a machine that plants seedlings directly in the soil. Bernard Kiwia and other inventors try to develop effective solutions. Some customers stop by his home to see his machinery in action. Many are interested in his solar-powered water heater. Here the most important part are the tubes. They are difficult to get, but all the other things can be sourced from local hardware stores. This one has used a metal food plate and normal iron sheeting. The most difficult thing is the heating tubes, but I realize that used fluorescent bulbs can work if you paint them. Built from second-hand materials, his solar water heater only costs around 155 euros, about half as much as a shop bought one. Thanks to his creativity and skill, Bernard Kiwia has become a successful eco-entrepreneur as well as an advisor to other aspiring innovators. Fantastic ideas. I wish we all could think of something simple and smart to protect our environment and also make the world a better place. But now we move from one very clever man to a bunch of very tough women in Zimbabwe. Yes, you're right. We're going to an all-female training camp for wildlife rangers. The admission criteria are strict but the employment chances for the women are good. We looked in on them to see what their training is like. This may look like basic training, but in fact, these women are competing to join a progressive conservation program. They want to be part of the Akashinga, an anti-poaching unit set up by an Australian soldier turned environmental activist. So in 2017, we recruited the first two all armed all-female uh, ranger squads here in Zimbabwe. Uh, and the program's now grown. We've gone from looking after one reserve to being looking after five uh, with a total of a million acres. The Akashinga, which means the brave ones in Shona, the local language, are willing to risk their lives to protect wildlife in Zimbabwe, Pundundu wildlife area. But they are also united in a desire for independence and self-determination. Many of the women are victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. Some were abandoned by their families. My husband used to abuse me. He was... I can just uh, simply say he was an abusive man. He was very violent to me, but I had no option. I have to move from that violent. So this is trans totally transforming the standard of life of all women. Uh, most of the women are developing themselves, and uh, some of them, they are financially independent. All Akashinga rangers come from communities near the area they patrol, so they know the locals and also have a different way of connecting with them. They are often more adept than their male counterparts at de-escalating potentially violent situations and showing people the importance of protecting wild animals. And I think uh, you know, this age-old cliche of, of winning the hearts and minds, it can only truly be one when we engage the local community and from everything I've seen in two decades of law enforcement across three continents uh, the best way to engage the local community and to get them on size is to work with the women. This time 80 applicants passed their recruitment test and are now starting their six months training. During that time the women also train with rifles in case they do have to engage heavily armed poachers. Since the establishment of the Allied Squad three years ago in Pundundu wildlife area, elephant poaching has dropped by 80% in the former trophy hunting tract. So far, the Akashinga have arrested 115 poachers using close combat techniques and without firing a single shot. Anyone who underestimates the female rangers does so at their peril. My name is Juliana Murumbi, and I joined this project of Akashinga in 2017. I remember when we were in Kenya, we did the training. We were mixed with the men, and uh, I managed to, to challenge men in physical training, even in running, uh, doing the long run, the push-ups, the sit-ups, uh, the drags. So I think we are just the same. Because what they can do, I can do. 
And in some cases, even better, another factor in the women's favor is that there has not been a single incident of corruption. The Akashinga have been a success on various fronts, and the model is now set to be expanded. By 2025, its founder wants to have a 1,000 female rangers in the field patrolling 20 packs. I hope this edition of the show has convinced you of the importance of caring for trees and maybe get you to rethink the use of firewood. And I hope you found our mixture of topics as interesting as I did. For now, it's goodbye from Abuja in Nigeria's capital territory. And it is a goodbye from me too here in Kampala. I am Sandra Trinoblio and I hope to have your company once again next week for another amazing episode of Eco Africa. Till then, do take care of yourself and goodbye. Uh -oh.